India has 2,226 tigers, which is 70% of the world's tiger population. Goa is one of the smallest states of India. Tourists know Goa for its golden beaches and its stunning coastline. But rarely traveling tourists know that the state of Goa is blessed with the towering presence of the Western Ghats and some of the most dense evergreen forest in the world. It is a home to five wildlife sanctuaries. The Kotigo Wildlife Sanctuary and the Netravali Wildlife Sanctuary in the south, the Bhagwan Mahavir Sanctuary and the Madai Wildlife Sanctuary further up north. The forest of Goa supports huge and rich biodiversity, both large and small. It has always had the presence of gores and leopards. Till 2011, the government of Goa was in total denial of tigers in Goa. But because of constant and rigorous campaigning by environmentalists like Mr. Rajendra Kirk, they were forced to set up camera traps, which proved that there was a need for presence of tigers in Goa. Five residential tigers were found in the Madai Wildlife Sanctuary, which adjoins the Bhimgar Wildlife Sanctuary of Karnataka. The Bhimgar Wildlife Sanctuary boast of a significant tiger population. Madhavi Wildlife Sanctuary in our staff galun total 20 camera traps sagle sanctuary bhar laila and ya sanctuary bhar ata busa naam ka trap aak 3 adults and 2 cubs photographs dala. The first tiger census was carried out in the year 1972 and the dramatic plunge in tiger numbers woke up the Indian government from its slumber. And hence Project Tiger was started in the year 1973 by the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. When initial efforts failed, the government started setting up exclusive tiger reserves which meant removing entire human population from the reserve area. Madai Wildlife Sanctuary was to be considered for Tiger Reserve too. But local politicians, because of their mining interest, opposed any such moves. So when I heard the Tiger Census 2018 was looking for volunteers, I decided to enroll myself as a volunteer. Tiger Census 2018 was a two-stage operation. In Stage 1, Ground information would be collected by the forest officials and volunteers. In stage 2, using that information which the ground officials have collected, camera traps would be set up. Stage 1 was a 7-day operation. It started from April 30, 2018 to May 6, 2018. On day 1, we had a routine briefing and a quick interaction with the forest officials. We were also assigned beats or sectors in the Madai Wildlife Sanctuary. I was assigned a tiger hotspot of Wainginim, which is known for its pristine, untouched forest. It is also considered one of the hotspots of tiger activity. Its close proximity, Bhimgar Wildlife Sanctuary, makes it a perfect tiger corridor. Other tiger hotspots include Kodal, Sathrem, Dongruli, Karansol, and Pandran. Kodal, Sathrem, and Dongruli lie on the higher ground, whereas Wanganim, Karansol, and Pandral are hotspots which are on the lower grounds of the sanctuary. At 6 next morning, a team of three myself, our tracker Umesh Gaonkar, and our guard Prashant Naik started our track 
Stage 1 of the tiger census was divided into two sub-phases. On first three days we would have the carnivore survey and on the next three days we would have the herbivore survey. In the carnivore survey our main aim is to sight animals and cover a minimum distance of 5 kilometers of the forest section, collecting scats, bug marks, hoof marks of animals. On each day we had to travel a different path. Also, our start and end points had to be different every day. As it was the first day, we decided we would travel via the main trail up to the village of Wanginim. And from there on, we would travel to the border village of Hoidia, which lies in Karnataka's Bhimgad Wildlife Sanctuary. The weather early morning was on the coolest side, even in this blistering hot month of May. Soon we encountered some scat of wild dogs or doles pretty close to the village. A quick sample was collected and the GPS reading of the position was taken. The GPS would also help us monitor the amount of kilometers we travel. We met some villagers from Wanginim along the way who my guide asked for any leopards or big cat movements to which he responded by telling him about sounds of leopards which he heard at night. Most of the children of Wanginim study outside the village in relatives' houses or in hostels as their village is pretty much inaccessible in the rains because of the river which is uncrossable during the monsoons. After travelling for around one kilometer, we reach Goa's most remote village of Wanginim. There is no electricity or water pipelines in the village, which consists only of four houses. Solar power is used for basic lighting. Main occupation is farming and casual plantation, for which water is pumped by diesel motors from the nearby rivulet. Most of the rivulets in Wanginim have some water left as it is in the lowlands compared to the higher forest areas of the wildlife century. And thus more animal presence is noted in this area. We decided to take a detour through the dried up river as it was a shorter route to the village of Hoidia and decided to walk down the main track while coming back. Progress was slow, as these big rocks make walking slow and they are quite slippery and one needs to walk slowly and watch his footing. The roots of the trees around have adapted uniquely to this environment. We finally reached the boundary stone of Goa Karnataka border. The road ahead went to Bhimgar Wildlife Sanctuary and into the village of Hoidia. We decided we would turn back here and started tracking back across the trackable forest road. We traveled around a kilometer and then we came across a large pug mark of a large cat on the path. We took measurements and it definitely looked like a pug mark of a tiger. We had struck gold on the first day, but we were not sure how old it was. We theorized that since it was on a walkable path, it must have been pretty recent or else it would have been easily lost. To reconfirm our theory, just a few meters away, we found a lot of fresh tiger droppings, not more than a week old. Just down the road was a large river system with some water left in it. This was a perfect spot for the tiger to come down to set up an ambush. Tigers are ambush hunters which rely on camouflage and with their sheer strength they can even take down large prey by surprise like seen in this rare tourist video. We took detailed samples and moved ahead reaching the village cashew plantation. On a jackfruit tree we found claw marks of a large black bear. The sheer presence of a black bear in close proximity to the village 
really puts this village in direct conflict with this wild animals. Black bears are fierce and highly aggressive in territory. They have been known to attack humans even on slight provocation. It was 11 and we ended our day near the large river which is at the boundary of the village, which separates it from the rest of the sanctuary. We took our GPS reading and a quick marker was set. After an uneventful second day and no sightings to report, on the third day we decided to enter the inner sanctums of the forest. Determined to get sightings, we started early. The day was much warmer. Each of us had one liter of water with us, which we had carried with us. The lighter you are on a track, the easier it is for you to move. As we moved into the deeper forest away from the track, the temperature and the humidity rose several times over inside the dense vegetation. One needs to be careful when one steps into the ground cover, which is covered by a carpet of dead leaves and is an ideal place for snakes, which seek a cooler environment under the refuge of leaf cover. As a small hump-nosed pit viper, we just went under my guard shoes. Things can become pretty claustrophobic and disorienting pretty soon as our experienced tracker could not get the right path. As we lost sight of our predetermined path, traveling most of the time on hilly terrain, we reached a point where we were almost out of water supply and we still could not locate our path. After traveling for more than 6 kilometers, we finally could see a river from the slope we were climbing down. If lost in a forest, following a river downstream is your best bet to get out of the maze. We followed the river and finally reached the predetermined point we wanted to reach. Trackers are generally locals who know the patch of the forest like the back of their hand. We were tired and heaved a sign of relief. We had reached close to our exit point from the forest. As we reached the edge of the forest, we were greeted by a sight of forest fire which had been set up freshly a day or two ago. Forest fires are generally man-made in this forest, either to clear path or just as a mischievous, irresponsible behavior on part of villagers who do so in order to farm their own crop in the cleared land or just to provoke the forest officials. This forest fire can cause a lot of damage and the carpet of dead leaves can spread this fire very easily, killing a lot of smaller biodiversity and also damaging old trees which are home to many rare birds. It was sad to see that the people of the forest, instead of helping, are taking steps which will seal their own fate. It was time for phase 2 of the 7 day census, which was the herbivorous song. For the rest of the 3 days, the forest patrol jeep dropped out at the predetermined spot in the forest. We traveled through pristine rainforest for 2 kilometers trying to get an early morning sighting of any animals in the 50 meter range. Every 400 meters we set up a mark and took a GPS reading. After reaching the 2 kilometers mark, we set up a circle of 20 meters circumference and did a quick vegetation count of trees more than 2 meters tall in ascending order. Also a 5 meter circle was set up to count plants below 2 meters and a 1 meter circle was made to count herbs and weeds. Also we made a 20 meter by 2 meter square and cleared up the entire patch of ground foliage. We searched for animal palettes and did a quick palette count. Our motive was to identify the herbivorous patterns and to make rough analysis of their movements and number. As the jeep arrived for the final time on the 15th, it was quite a mixed feeling. 
I learned a lot about wildlife tracking and got a great behind the scenes of the methodology used. Based on the data collected by us and the other teams, camera traps would now be set up. I gained a deep understanding on how serious the problem of human-animal conflict was and the difficulties of the terrain which made extensive patrolling very difficult. Today technology has transformed at its quantum pace. With the advent of night vision cameras, camera drones, patrolling methods and crime detection methods and prevention methods have changed remarkably a lot of countries around the world are using such technologies for military and civilian purposes. A lot of wildlife conservation efforts are being done using drone monitoring technology. I wondered why such technology was not being used in India, which is the home to 70% of world's tiger population. It is something which still leaves me baffled. In the year 2012 to 2017, we lost 22% of 508 tigers which died to the cases of poaching. Two camera traps which were recently set up in Madai Wildlife Sanctuary were stolen by unknown miscreants, which leaves a lot of concerns to be addressed. We had almost reached the end of the census. We had a lot of secondary evidences but very few sightings, which had left me a bit down in spirits. The RFO of Madai Wildlife Sanctuary, Mr. Prakash Shalilkar, one of the most honest and dedicated officers in India, known for his exemplary dedication, sensed our feeling and arranged for us to be a part of the night patrol jeep to the village of Hoidia. It was an exciting offer even if it meant a bumpy ride in the back of a jeep to witness different shades of the forest in the night. We spotted a herd of gaur near the close proximity of the forest as we travelled all the way to the village of Hoidia in Karnataka and returned back. Though we did not spot any big cats, a good prey base was always a great sign. It was one of the most amazing experiences as a wildlife lover I could have had and I'm glad I could have contributed in some way to save the spirit of the forest, Altaikas.